Welcome to the Industry Supported Symposium, Facilitating Constructive Remodeling in Complex Wounds, Advances in Extracellular Matrix Technologies. This activity is supported by an educational grant from ACEL Inc. Our faculty presenters are Dr. Claire Dillingham and Dr. Bruce Kramer. Please review the following disclosures. This session will explore cases illustrating the use of ECM technologies for managing complex, traumatic, and surgical wounds. Presenters will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, and we encourage you to chat with your colleagues throughout the session. Thank you, and please enjoy the session. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. I'm excited to share with you the information that we have here today. My name is Claire Dillingham. I'm at Cone Health in Greensboro, and we're gonna talk about some exciting things with wound healing. We know that with wound healing, our work is not gonna be done anytime soon. The amount of patients that we see on a yearly basis for wound care is in the millions for traumatic wounds worldwide each year. The complexity of presentation of acute and traumatic wounds requires multiple management, including simple skin closure to lengthy reconstructive procedures. Now that can be skin grafts, flaps, or even amputations. Those are the ones we're trying to, to particularly avoid. These amputations can lead patients with significant morbidity and loss of focus, uh, focus, focus and function. Furthermore, long-term scar responses can require numerous follow-up techniques and reconstruction. Uh, reconstructive technology has been developed for solutions for the body to help reconstruct with a more natural soft tissue where scarring would be expected. So if we look at some of the research that, that's out there, the University of Pittsburgh did a study where they wanted to, to understand the host response to 14 chemically I'm sorry, commercially available ECM-based products. So they looked at many of these products that you're familiar with, as well as the Matristem. In order to do so, an abdominal muscular defect was created in the rat model, as you can see. The device was then implanted. It was studied at the 14-day mark, the 35-day mark. And you can see here with many of the devices treated, often for applications and they're typical for abdominal wall, reinforcement for pelvic floor defects. You can also see the majority of these products are derived from dermal tissue. And the ones that have um, asterisks have typically been the chemically cross-linked ones. So that'll help put it into framework for you. By cross-linking the product, a natural structure is altered by chemicals such as the glutaraldehyde, um, this often represents a higher mechanical strength and resistance to the degradation, but also may include some negative uh, host response that we, we're trying to avoid. And we're going to talk a little bit about those. So what we have here is the histologic uh, slides from, from those studies. The images were from the device that represent each of the different types of host responses. So to orient you in each Im image, the device can be seen on the top half of the frame and the native abdominal wall on the lower half. So within the study, the researchers display that the cross-linking, the extracellular matrix led to a foreign body response and was ultimately resulting in the, the device being encapsulated or walled off from the body. Cells are unable to penetrate into the material and therefore the body lays down extensive fibrous collagen around the, the periphery of the device. Sometimes this is helpful, but uh, particularly in plastic surgery, it can it be a, a downside to the healing process. So that's seen with the purple band of cells highlighted in the black box. So you see that typically to the right of each of the responses. A thick fibrous capsule can also be seen in the high magnification image that you see at the 35 day mark. The representative product for this response type is displayed that, that I have here is the Colomid. It's a cross-linked product derived from the porcine dermis. Then we see the, the classic encapsulation. So these will be histologic images of devices that are representative of each of the different types. And then to orient you with these, 
we have, we can see the complete or the classic encapsulation response. And this is a little bit different in that it, you can see the clear definition between where the native tissue was and where the portion of the healing has come up. So th that's, that's pretty interesting. And then the integration response, this one here is a utilization from a number of applications in current clinical practice. They show the products tend to have a dense collagen structure that requires multiple steps, uh, detergents at times uh, to remove the majority of the cellular content because you, you don't want an immune response that's so active that the product is rejected. Dermal products were found to integrate into the host tissue following implantation. In the representative histologic slide, the product Intizen was a uh, non-cross-linked form of porcine dermis that was used. It showed the ability for cells to adequately populate the scaffold. However, the cells were unable to break down or remodel the device into the new functional tissue. And that's what you want. You wanna replace like tissue with like tissue. So these scaffolds did not elicit the formation of a capsule from the host, but on the other hand, they didn't degradate or remodel by the host either. So the scaffold became integrated into the surrounding host tissue, but didn't facilitate new functional tissue formation. And that's what we really want. So eventually the scaffold may degrade over a period of years and form fibrous tissue. And if you've seen that before, you know it's hard tissue that's often um, not very functional as well. So the site appropriate response is what what we want for, for all our healing. And this is the, the final response that was studied and it showed the constructive remodeling. So it represented in these images is the matrix stem. So that's what we're talking about today. In the histologic image, you can see that by the 14th day of the implantation, the device had been substantially infiltrated by an abundant number of mononuclear host cells in and around the scaffolding. So by the 35th day, there's no morphologic evidence of the scaffold and there appears to be the formation of islands of mature skeletal muscle developing in place of the device. So there was no evidence of fibrous encapsulation. So remember that the study was performed on a rat. And so this has a higher metabolic rate than in the human tissue. So keep that in mind. So the results of 35 days in this study are not indicative of what you would see in 35 days in the human model, but it is a representation of the acceleration that we can see. So in other words, it's not expected that the matrix stem would completely degradate in the 35 days in a clinical setting. Most likely this would take place in five to nine months, and it would depend on the type of tissue, the amount, the size. Um, so that, that would vary some. So then when we look at where all of these um, different products fell into this, these three categories of encapsulation, integration, and site-appropriate remodeling. So we can see here the research asked a trained histopathologist to, to provide a histologic score for each of these types of tissues for both a positive and negative host response. So for example, any evidence of neo-revascularization or new tissue formation, um, received a higher score and evidence of fibrous encapsulation or foreign body response received a lower score. So the three distinct responses were the encapsulation, the integration, and the construction remodeling. So the it seemed to create three distinct forms, and so they were put into those three distinct forms, as you can see here. So it was calculated at the 14 days and then again at 35 days. The encapsulated group in general had the lower histologic score, but the majority of scaffold in, investigated in the study fell into the integrated group. So that's uh, encouraging, with many of the devices being dermal products. So in fact, the only two products that fell into the constructive remodeling group were the matristem and the surgices. So if you've used either of those two before, it'll probably you'll probably start thinking about what kind of response you see um, when you start seeing the patients back. So it's important to note that the 14 ECM based materials, despite all being marketed as biologic mesh, the host response varied quite a bit. Um, so that's pretty impressive. So when we look at the macrophage polarization, here's a nice uh, character formation of 
what, what you see and what's going on when you're talking about the M2 versus the M1 effect. Um, and that's really what you want. And we're gonna, we're gonna show that again in another um, slide here that shows it even more um, specifically. So we sought to identify, or the research sought to identify what factors can be influencing the different host response to each of these devices. And the studies suggest that the macrophages can play a role in the, um, the way that the modulating the host response takes place with the implanted material. So in general, naive macrophages migrate to a site of injury and they polarize into one or two main types based on what they encounter. So the first type, the macrophage one, has, which you can see here with the positive staining for the CCR7 in orange. So you can see that mostly on the left. It's associated with a pro-inflammatory or scarring response. The second is the macrophage two, and that's seen by the CD206 in green. Um, so you can see a little bit more of that in the middle slide and the slide on the right. So it's associated with pro-remodeling or anti-inflammatory response. So by understanding these, with individual macrophage types and the ratio of the M2 to the M1, you can see within an implanted scaffold, it can be proposed that the higher M2 to M1 ratio will more likely result in a constructive remodeling of tissue in the presence of the foreign um, object. In the same study uh, by Brown, it showed that the cross-linked and the acellular dermal matrix had a higher presence of the M1 macrophages as shown in the orange yellow stain whereas the major stem had a higher presence of the M2 type macrophage, which is the green as mentioned. So the red staining indicates the presence of all macrophages in the cells. So it, it's undifferentiated. And the blue stain indicates a cell nuclear, um, nuclei, both of um, the stain positive in all extracellular matrix studied. So graphically, it can, you can see that the matrix stem is associated with higher levels of M2 to M1 presence. This suggests that the higher biologic scores associated with the matrix stem can be a result of uh, encouraging higher macrophage 2 response or the M2 concentration at the site of injury. And so that's what that's key there for what we want to happen. So let's talk, let's now go to some clinical perspectives. And I think this will be helpful in really honing down some particular patients that you may have in mind that can be helped by this device. And hopefully you will have um, had the opportunity to try this. And um, if you have questions, we'll have time to go through those. So I'm, I'm excited to hear from you. So our first patient is a 51 year old female. Uh, she had a degloving scalp injury. This was May, I'm sorry, March of, um, it was cold. It's North Carolina, so it was um, still cold out. Um, it gets warmer come um, April. So she was in a motor vehicle accident, incidentally, right across the street from the hospital, but she wasn't found for 24 hours. So she was hypothermic. She was in shock. She was in rhabdo. She had acute kidney failure. She had compartment syndrome of her arm, and she was missing more than 50% of her scalp, as you can see. She did not come with the scalp. Um, this is how she actually came in. So um, she was seen immediately by the trauma surgeon. She had uh, pretty soon um, an amputation of her arm because of the compartment syndrome. And um, was put on dialysis, um, was um, made to normal thermal temperature, and then I was called. And so when we think about scalp reconstructions, um, we're going to take a step back and, and talk a little bit more generally about scalp reconstruction. We think about covering the bone. We want it to be covered as quick as possible. We also want a really good aesthetic result. And that can be uh, quite a challenge when patients come in and have a majority of the scalp missing. So the things that influence the decision are the size and the location of the defect, how much bone is exposed, the, the quality of the surrounding tissue. Is it, is it clean, contaminated? Is it dirty? Is it infected? Um, where is the hairline? How much hair do they have? What are their comorbidities? Um, and so what we need for reconstruction is a combination of the knowledge of the anatomy of the scalp, 
the hair physiology, biomechanics? What are our options in tissue reconstruction? Um, do we need expansion or do we even need to go to a free tissue uh, graft? And so all of these are what we think about. So we, from an anatomy standpoint, we think about the layers of the scalp. Um, and I just put that up there as a review. And so we think about what is missing and what do we need to replace? Because if we don't get back to some sense of what's missing to try and reconstruct it, we may not have a long-term result. And so those are some of the things that we think about. So the layers, of course, you think about the SCALP um, with your skin, your subcutaneous tissue, your aponeurotic layer, loose areola tissue, tissue, your pericranium. Now keep in mind that the scalp is fairly thick when we think about the different areas of the body. So it's three to eight millimeters as opposed to our upper eyelids, which are, is much thinner, uh, some of the thinnest skin. And so we want to have what we need to replace that. When we think from a historical standpoint and we think about what, what has been done over the years, um, we've really um, advanced quite a bit in what we can offer patients. If we go all the way back to the 1600s, we, we have writings from France where um, they allowed the bare cranium to granulate um, and, and then epithelialize after that. Those are the kind of cases that can be real challenging, but that we wanna be able to offer something to patients and not have to wait for that. Um, in that waiting period, a lot of um, complications can occur, in infection and, and therefore, um, something that we wanna to try to avoid. And most times we can. And then we look into the um, 1800s and there was some success with skin grafting, but it was placed right on the bone um, after there was some, sometimes um, some granulation tissue. Um, but again, that can really break down easily with one little scratch or uh, one little um, disruption of the tissue. And then you don't have the cell signaling from around for the healing process. And so this went on until um, the 1970s when um, the replant um, was tried, um, which, you know, if you, if you get the, the scalp that comes in with the patient, depending on the injury, um, a replant um, can be a pretty exciting procedure. Um, in our case, we didn't have that as the example. So we want to replace like with like, and there's no other kind of uh, tissue in the body that has that kind of thickness with that much hair for the most part. Um, and so you need coverage to prevent the desiccation and the infection rates that can occur with the scalp and the, the bone that's exposed. We also want it to be pleasing. We want it to look good. Um, most people want the hair back and if they didn't have hair to start with it, they'd like it <laughs> to, um, to come back. Um, We'll still work on that, but uh, not quite there yet. So nearly 50% of the scalp can be covered with tissue expansion alone. And this is usually a staged procedure. So still not something that would be done in the emergent situation, but something that we would think about for the future. So when we think about um, what we need to do to get the reconstruction, we have to think about the location, the size, the thickness. Um, it's often broken down into less than two, mil two centimeters, two to 25 centimeters, and then the greater than 25 centimeters squared. Um, so less than two, primary closure is usually pretty, pretty possible. Um, you can do some... Um, releasing um, of the, um, the scalp, and, and that often helps. Uh, once you get to the 25 area, local flaps can be used, 25 centimeters, and then more than that, then you start thinking about your latissimus, your radial forearm, your periscapular, your omentum. And so certainly these were things that um, very quickly went through my mind with this patient, but keeping in mind the trauma situation, the hypothermia, the rhabdo and um, her overall status, she was not in any um, place of being able to really jump into any of these more extensive um, reconstruction options. Um, and so the thought was, what can I do right now to help with that, the very simple prevention of the desiccation um, so that maybe she'll have an option for, for one of those um, more extensive surgeries in the near future. Well, it happened to be that I had just learned about the um, acellular dermal matrix, 
uh, or urinary bladder matrix. And so this was actually the very first patient that uh, I did the, that I actually tried this product on. Um, and so I took her to the OR, debrided uh, what you, you can see there, debrided and burned down that outer table in order to get some good, healthy tissue, um, get it all cleaned up. And then um, she had the uh, micro, micro matrix powder placed and then the Cytel. Um, it's now called the Cytel. And, um, and then I put Adaptic on it and uh, we hydrated it with either Surgilube or KY. Um, and you can see here after one week, I was somewhat horrified uh, and I thought I, I've, this is terrible. Um, this is all turned to Escar. And uh, fortunately, the um, rep was able to pull me down from the tree and encourage me to just hydrate it. And so if you have seen this before, um, I'll, I'll encourage you, hydration makes a huge difference. And you're going to see this in the, the next picture. So here we are after just another week, two, and then up to four weeks of just hydrating it. So I was in, extremely impressed. This is an incredible amount of granulation tissue that I have not seen in any other product up to this point um, to do, to be able to provide that much granulation tissue so quickly. And again, you can see here on the, the left side, a little bit more of the um, A-cell vet head or the, the urinary bladder that had dried out. And then again on the right side, but you see it's starting to hydrate. You see the depth difference between, if you can see my mouse here, um, between the native tissue and the tissue that had been all exposed by the bone, it's starting to fill in. And so this is incredible. So at the four week mark, um, micro matrix was placed. And then at the five week mark here, um, we had placement in the ICU and uh, one more sheet of the Cytel had been placed, um, discontinued with uh, hydration. And then we were able to skin graft it and she has had no further surgery. So this is very impressive because this would be a patient that I would have expected to have some breakdown um, here and there. Um, and she had no breakdown and we are, I think six or seven years from her surgery. Um, she's still alive. Um, she is in a group home and, and actually doing well. So um, she was the very first test. You can imagine how pleased the representative was that this was the very first patient. <laughs> no no uh, challenge there. Um, so here we are before and after. So great result. And this gave a lot of encourage to, encouragement to me to continue to see what else this product was able to do in regards to wound healing. So the next patient is a 63 year old man. He had a leg ulcer. He had peripheral vascular disease. And the call I got was that he presented to the emergency room because he had a cold leg, not because of this wound. He had bumped it on the side of his bed. Uh, he knew he had the wound there, but his foot was hurting because it was cold. And so he underwent a um, bypass, a, a knee pop uh, artery bypass, with a graft place, um, reverse ipsilateral greater saphenous vein. Um, five days later, um, I was called because they said he, a vascular surgeon said he has a gray pulse. He's doing great. Can you do something with this wound? So I, I thought, okay, um, that's a lot of bone exposed. It's black. So it's denuded, it's been exposed for a while. On the left, you can see that. On the right, you can see uh, he has a tendon exposed. And so this is the about the middle to middle lower portion um, of the, the leg anterior. And so I was concerned, okay, the, I don't think the, grass, the gastroc's gonna reach. Um, we don't have a whole lot of options because of his bypass. Um, so maybe a free flap? Um, maybe that would, would get it covered. Um, there are some other products out there that maybe would, 
would work. But with that much bone exposed, I was really concerned that it would continually break down. And so I decided to give uh, the A-cell, um, the urinary bladder matrix, a try. So let's talk about lower extremity reconstruction. And so here we see the, the ladder of, of our decisions between uh, what we have and to, to work with, um, is what we have salvageable, um, do we need to go up the ladder? We think about um, whether or not an amputation is needed. Can we do a below knee, above knee? Um, and, and this patient, if um, this was low enough that I think we could have done a below knee, um, but had he had any further breakdown, then he may have even been an above knee, um, which would have meant a huge difference in his overall function. And so we think about the Castillo classification of the wounds, the sizes and the grades and, and whether or not we can reconstruct or whether or not we have to go to uh, a real extensive free flap. And so I have that there as a review, um, just something to keep in mind um, because there was a time where um, if a patient wasn't eligible for free flap, the only other option was uh, amputation. And um, that's what we're trying to prevent. So when we think about the lower extremity, we think about upper, middle, and lower thirds, what's available, what works well, um, what options that we have. And so whether or not the gastroc, soleus, or free flap is available, it used to be these. this was it. These were our options, and we didn't have a whole lot in between. Now that we have a lot of um, products out there, we do have options that are really exciting. And we still think about the Mathis and High classification and what, what uh, muscles are going to be used, which ones are more successful where. Um, and that helps us to define sort of the next steps. We think about the gastroc as being coverage for that proximal one third of the tibia, where the medial or the lateral head can be used. Um, typically, um, it, it somewhat depends on the length we need and uh, the location of the wound. Um, the gastroc uh, gets its blood supply from the sural artery, um, also called popliteal artery. And um, so we, we know we can divide that and use that and there's, there's still function left to the leg. Um, so something that, um, it, it's a nice flap, it's a good one. Um, we see here the, the breakdown in the cross section and that helps us to, to look at some of the possibilities of what's available for reconstruction. And so uh, in this patient, he was a three pack per day smoker. And fortunately, um, he was willing to stop. He said, yes, he was willing to stop smoking. He, he wanted to keep his leg, he would do whatever it took. And of course we've heard that before um, and we wanna believe everybody. Fortunately in this patient, um, he was very sincere and, and he's it's been a, a real pleasure to work with um, over the years. Um, I, I've seen him in follow up, but this was back in 2013. So I took him to the OR. I removed that outer table where the bone had been denuded and, and black. We got to the punctate bleeding and then we used a uh, Cytel wound sheet. This one on the left, it's a, actually it's a six layer sheet. And then it's covered with the adaptic that you see here on the, the top and the bottom. So six layer sheet, um, the powder, the micro matrix powder was also used. And then um, it was covered with the adaptic and uh, negative wound pressure was utilized for this patient with once a week uh, changes. Um, you can see within four weeks, you're starting to see quite a bit of granulation tissue around the edges. And it looks like something's happening in the center. Um, it, I, I felt it. it, it didn't seem, it felt like there was incorporation of the material. It wasn't just uh, resting on the tissue. Um, and so I, I left it there. At the time, this was still very new to me. So I said, well, it looks good. It, smells pretty good. The patient's pain is good. I'm going to give it a little bit more time and see what happens. And so here you can see at eight weeks, even more granulation tissue. And that posterior part where the tendon was, the tendon was not resected. That's actual granulation tissue that's formed right over that tendon. 
So this was really incredible. And the, the, the patient, again, he, he actually did stop smoking. And I'm sure that helped. The other things, of course, that I keep in mind are your nutrition status, making sure that we've got the multivitamins, the vitamin C, uh, zinc. If they're on um, um, steroids, um, supplement with the vitamin A, working with the primary physician, make sure we're not on any, the patient's not on any compromising medications that the vitamin A would contradict. Um, so doing all of that in coordination with the wound care. Um, and the two go hand in hand. Um, so here we are at 10 weeks and he has near complete incorporation of the A-cell with um, looking also at the peri-wound area, marked improvement in the swelling. So it's really encouraging. Um, and then it was at this point that um, I, I would have. So you may ask, um, would I have skin grafted at the point of the 10 weeks. Absolutely. Um, I think that that would have been ready for skin grafting. Um, due to insurance coverage, it was delayed. Um, so we continued with the dressing changes and then we were able to do finally the skin graft. And here he is um, uh, a couple weeks after the skin graft, um, which was four months after the original injury where he is skin grafted. Um, very encouraging. He has, he did not require any further surgery after that. Um, so he had full take. Uh, here is a three year and three and a half year post-op. Um, so marked improvement and continued to see improvement even three years between the three and three and a half year, he still had improvement, uh, which I find really interesting. Um, the, I believe I have a picture here um, that posterior part where that tendon was, that part was not skin grafted. That part actually epithelialized on its own. And you can see there's a difference in the color. So it's really interesting to see what the body is doing um, in its own healing process with the urinary bladder matrix. So I want to thank all of you for joining uh, for uh, this really exciting talk. It's, it's something that I really enjoy uh, discussing because it's changed the way that I approach wounds um, from, oh dear, what am I going to do to, oh, I've got something that will help this. And so it's been really encouraging to be able to see results that up until this time have, have not exceeded what I have seen with the urinary bladder matrix. So uh, best wishes on using this and I'm uh, looking forward to any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dillingham for your presentation of these very interesting cases. I'd like to continue on now by additional cases and some more science. Um, I'm just now as of July 1st, the emeritus professor of the Division of Plastic Surgery at St. Louis University as I've retired and enjoying sunny Florida here. But 10 years ago, on uh, September 20th, 2010, um, I had a rep come into my office and said that you could put this powder on fingertips and it can regrow fingertips. And I was going, well, that sounds interesting. But the very next day, this patient came in and lo and behold, he was a truck driver, stuck his fingers in a fan belt and came in with this injury pattern. The problems with this is that with multiple fingertips, they were gonna be revision amputations. But we tried the powder on them. There's the first placement of the powder I've done using this device. And at eight days later, with serial alternate day placements, we had tissue forming over the ends of the fingers. So we kept writing this out with alternate days. He was healed at nine weeks, but that shows you the results of his pictures at 64 weeks. And this was a result that I could not get any other way. And I was most impressed. Um, to date, this is probably my most impressive fingertip case. So at least if you have to have a case that hooks you on the use of a device, it would be that. So I've used the device now um, up until my retirement a week ago. Um, and here we have the case breakdown. So I've used it all over the body, not primarily on just fingertips. There's 102 cases there, but on all over the body. The ones I'd like to specifically focus on is this 198 cases. This is uh, wounds of significance in the lower third of the ankle and the foot, which many cases would have required free flaps. And so much to the chagrin of my residents, but to my glee, I've avoided doing quite a few free flaps in other of these, these situations, which can be quite challenging in the population. So these devices, I've used them all over the body in many different applications. 
we published some of the results. These are the lower third cases, showing the device works with open fractures and with exposed hardware with certificate infections of methicillin sensitive, methicillin resistant, pseudomonas, you can see the grouping there. So it's proved effective even in the face of significant bacterial colonization. This shows you some of those cases. Here we have on the left side, the tendons showing these healing going here. This patient did have some skin grafting. Depending on the size of the wound, I may not use the device solely, but may use it in addition to skin grafting. And here's an elderly 80 plus year old patient who had his hope and fractured uh, plate become exposed. We got him healed up to the point the plate could be removed. This patient had a significant degloving injury. And as you can see, the size of the skin graft, as the body heals, it's replaced with more normal tissue. And you'll see other examples as we go ahead. It became a, very apparent to me that I had to understand the macrophage because something was going on biologically quite differently. So this shows you a scanning image of the macrophage. And when you drill into it, this shows you a lot of the biochemical interaction. So it's very complex and that just gives me a headache. Uh, so I like simplicity. So this is kind of more of the simplistic way and some of what Dr. Dillingham had, uh, had alluded to. When you first have an injury, initially there's a preponderance of M1 macrophage healing and you have more scarring. And later on, as it remodels, you get a more of an M2 macrophage response. But you get this scar from the M1 macrophage, which is always something we fight and sometimes never can beat. Um, this book was written by my uh, boss uh, at the time as a resident and then as an attending, Dr. Weeks, along with Chris Ray. But basically, at the time when they wrote this back in the 70s, they basically said that we're limited by the biologic processes of tissue repair. This book was significant because they took all the biology known at the time and then applied it to how we did hand surgery. And these biologic processes can produce a favorable environment and get a functional recovery or an unfavorable uh, recovery. And this is what we're basically talking about. We have the initial inflammation phase, then we have the cell proliferation and matrix deposition phase with later matrix remodeling. But we can now, with these devices, decrease the inflammation so we don't have to get all that scarring going on. And then we can drive this remodeling phase to an earlier phase. So while I was taught one has to respect these processes and deal with them, now I can drive them and modulate them. So it's nice in the term of a career to have been taught something and then try to turn it on its head. So what I'd like to do today is to show you how these technologies can uh, facilitate the constructive remodeling healing, how to optimize wound care management, and then how to reduce donor site morbidity and costs, especially if you don't need to use other flaps or, or tissue devices. So this shows you a scanning EM of the uh, freeze-dried lyophilized uh, device of the UBM. Interestingly enough, Integra, which is one of the first devices used in this kind of arena, is very similar in the porosity. Here we have dermis, scanning EMs of dermal devices, and they're much, much thicker, and amniotic tissue is thinner, but still with some thickness layers to them. What's important about an ECM device is how it's prepared, because you really want to preserve the unique biology of the device. So again, with the UBM device, with several hours of processing, you can get all the cells out and get all that particular out, so you preserve the pristine biology. When you have a thicker or denser device, you have to treat it for longer periods of time, perhaps with more caustic agents. And so you have an altered debris and plus it's hard to get it out. So when you have cellular debris and some alteration, you get more scarring formation. Um, what's important, everybody says, is stem cells. There are no stem cells in the device. Um, and it has an intact basement membrane. It's the only ECM device with an intact basement membrane. And because of all that, it promotes angiogenesis, innervation, it modulates the inflammatory response and brings in site-specific cells. It also is resistant to infection, as I've shown uh, in our publications. So here's how the device is. You have a powder, you have a lyophilized device, as we see here, and then there's a vacuum press device, which is much denser, which doesn't mean that it's got cellular debris. It just means it's a denser device. So the you can see right here with the scanning image of the particles, they're just all broken up, but there's a lot more surface area. So it's very active because the cells can get in and interact at all the different surface area. This is broken down over the period of a week or two while the powder's days. And this is over the period of several weeks it takes for this device to become broken down and constructively remodeled, incorporated into the patient. This just shows you a simple example. I like doing forehead flaps for nasal tip reconstructions, as you can see here. Here's a flap that was brought down and I use this on the undersurface of the pedicle to see. And this is an example of just in situ you can see. 
And this is an example of a pedicle which didn't have the uh, device placed. So you can see much more inflammation. Here is the ECM device, and this is this kind of granulation tissue. You'll see this popping up again in later cases, showing this kind of uh, salmon colored granulation tissue. And there it is at the division and inset, and sorry, the black, the black out, but if you can appreciate her nose, that tip, it's really invisible. So I was taught that these should be maybe a uh, multi-stage procedure, but we can now get down to a flap and then an inset procedure. So you can cut down some stages of the reconstruction with a superior device. Here is a very interesting case that took care of where this gentleman had a rollover injury and you can see the degloving injury to his hand. That was actually his good hand because his other hand had a congenital dislocation of the elbow, a tumor of his ulna, and so at a fracture of his radius. And so outside hospital was gonna amputate his fingers and that kind of look is good if you're going to Texas uh, football games, but not so much for function, especially for his good hand. So one operative procedure, we put powder and the sheets in the wounds, total operative cost of the device was $5,100. Here is his wound care. I put tubing down and wrapped his fingers up and then stuck them in a pampers. So three to five cc's of saline per finger per day. This is how his wound looked at two weeks. And this isn't a bad wound. This is an uh, ECM reconstructed wound forming. What you want to appreciate is that there's not infection. The hand should be wretchedly swollen with all this inflammation and it's not. So there's markers. We have to look at the peri wound area to get an idea of what's going on. And here he is healed. Now this is more delayed, but he was healed at two and a half months. One operative procedure. Look at the color match, the functionality. So again, there were tendons absent, but yet he's showing you extensor tendon function and the fingers are functioning well. I tried to get follow-up visits on him, but unfortunately um, he's deceased. Um, this shows you a patient's fingers that I took care of many years ago and shows you how classic management would have been with the groin flaps and dactylization and multiple procedures or division and inset. That's a look at a year and it still wasn't anything like what we can now get with these devices. Stadler did one of the most uh, detailed analyses of the ECM devices present. And they're mostly collagen, as you can see here in this breakdown and in the collagen abundance here. But lots of collagen one and three. So again, a lot of the devices type one and threes, but there's matrosomal proteins, non-matrosomes, and then you have different uh, ECM affiliated proteins. So again, mostly collagens, but some type seven collagens here. There's 517 unique molecules developed. And again, the preponderance of them is the collagens here. You can get down into the glycoproteins over here through all the breakdown. I'm not gonna drill you through them. 23 ECM and ECM affiliated proteins. There they are there and their abundances. And there were 434 additional molecules. Now in the study, they studied three specimens and not all these molecules are present in all specimens, but that again, it's a biologic device and their uniqueness to it and this may explain partly why some of the devices may work a little bit different in certain areas than others and why certain patients may have a better response. But we're throwing, instead of several proteins or devices on the wound, we're throwing the whole uh, chemical uh, mix of proteins and different molecules on the wound. I wanna talk about type seven specifically here now because type sevens with the basement membrane as well as in type four, Type four is in the red dots, type seven is in, this, uh, in the blue dot here. And when you look at the native bladder and then the ECM. So the native bladder to prepare the device, as Dr. Gillingham has told, it's you strip off the epithelium and you have the basement membrane. There's no nothing in the cyst devices or the liver devices, which are also out the market. But this shows you with just topically placing uh, collagen type seven on the wound in these rat models, comparing it controls to the wound. The, there's a significant increased rate of closure of the wounds with type 7 collagen. And you could say, oh, that's just scar contracture. It's not. They did the histology and showed that there is decreased myofibroblasts in these wounds. So again, type 7 collagen alone, instead of the other 543 molecules, uh, really affects a lot of good healing. So what we have here is a UBM ECM device, which is a meshwork of functional and different structural proteins, as we showed, that provides a mechanical framework for each tissue and organ it's dynamic, there's a reciprocity with the body breaking it down and replacing it, and it really restores some tissue homeostasis, which I think I can show you in some later cases. In addition, as these are broken down, other molecules become exposed. So it's just not releasing these molecules, but other molecules within the device become exposed, and that shows you some of them there. So again, there's many, many molecules and many interactions going on in the wound with time. So here we have the tissue, we prepare the scaffold, we implant it, 
and then you get this wonderful response. But for it to go all the way on important, these take time. So if you have a rush to take care of a wound, these aren't the devices. The body has to reconstructively remodel with them and interact with them for them to really work well. So uh, this was another interesting study trying to gain insight into what the heck is really going on. Um, these are a study down of wounds of 18 patients split between diabetics and non-diabetic wounds. And they looked at the M1 macrophage, the M2 macrophage scores of these wounds. And so overall, the uh, diabetics had higher M1, uh, M1 more inflammatory response than the normals. And all the patients had an uh, increased M2 response post-treatment, as you can see here. Um, and this wasn't standardized, however. These were wounds that were uh, surgically operated on, and then seven to 14 days later, additional tissues were taken. But uh, again, to note, the device increases the M2 macrophage, heal, macrophage response in all the post uh, specimens. There was a similar wound reduction in all the groups and patients, and there was a significant rate of wound closure, greater seen in the normals than the diabetics. But this is the take home message really, that the M1, M2 score post abridements, here we have the non-diabetics and the diabetics. Again, more inflammation in the diabetics, but when you compare them post-treatment, the diabetics had a similar inflammatory score to the, di to the non-diabetics. So we are actually normalizing this pro-inflammatory response we see in the diabetic wounds with these devices, and that's really great. And the better your M1, M2 ratio goes, the more rapid your wound healing. So this is starting to give us some insights into the, actually we are showing, we're modulating what's going on in the wound with these devices in a very favorable fashion. Um, this is a diabetic patient I took care of, had this ulcer for two years on the bottom of his foot and this tissue growth that was with it, had had a prior metatarsal res uh, head resection, but we took the specimen off, sent it to pathology just to check it and lo and behold, they said it was an aggressive fibromatosis. They wanted to get negative margins. Well, to get negative margins in this, we had to take out the third and the fourth metatarsal head. And so this skin right here in the center of the wound is the skin on the dorsum of the foot. So we're through and through the foot to the dorsal skin of the foot. And by the way, this was also infected with staph and proteus. So we went ahead and then, so what I like to do is I put the, the thickest layer of the device on the outer layers, I put the powder and then the burn matrix. So I put the powder against the wound, the burn matrix, the um, lyophilized sheets here, and then the vacuum press sheets on the outer layers because it holds sutures better. And I will stuff the wound up. As you can see, I put more of the sheet in there. So I spackled the wound, if you will. I filled it up with the device. And this is how the patient came in, but you can see here. They're not a negative, Dan. You can see uh, his wound well, care maybe wasn't optimal. So yeah. again, even with suboptimal healing and wound care, I'm sorry, with suboptimal care, the wounds will continue to heal. I used a silver foam in this case. We got to this point, as you can see, but the wound totally the foot wound healed is in. now healed. There is very good mobility, the mobility of the tissue above and below without adherence. So again, what's going on here? Something still more is going on here. So I uh, tried to drill into it and study the science more. And these are scanning EMs of mesothelial cells and cells talk to each other by vesicles. So extracellular vesicles are very important. And this shows you a magnified view. There's large, and then there's these small vesicles. And when we go ahead and look at the UBM ECM device, lo and behold, it's speckled with these little vesicles too. So these devices have these little nano vesicles all over them. And so it, these are really an integral function of the ECM bioscaffolds. And they contain little parts of micro RNA, which can really modulate the macrophage activation. And so all of these in, give us insights as to how it's doing. It's not just providing these molecules, but we have these microvesicles now, which have messenger RNA, which are essentially kind of reprogramming the macrophages. Further studies showed by isolating these that these vesicles alone can give you this macrophage activation with these devices. And what's interesting, both the UDM and the CIS devices have these uh, fragments of micro RNA. And if you inhibit these uh, little bits of RNA, you really block the anti-inflammatory properties of this. So really these little bits of messenger RNA in those vesicles is in a very significant way giving us this anti-inflammatory response we're seeing. And then they become internalized. And so this is all opening up and becoming a very fervent area of uh, more recent study.
And these nanovesicles are present in dermal devices, they're present in the UBM devices, as well as in the subintestine submucosa devices. Oh, one more thing. Uh, the, they can also, one messenger RNA can regulate multiple genes, and multiple genes can be regulated by one messenger RNA. So there's a whole lot of this science and biology we're just figuring out. And it's not only that, these, they're specific lipids, proteins, carbohydrates. As these things butt off the cells, this is the unique. This isn't just cell membrane proteins. There are specific uh, parts of the cells. So it's not just the, uh, the, the messenger RNA, it's all the molecules contained within. So let's look at some cases. Here's a man who had a mining injury, had the gloving of his fingertips, and um, he wanted to go back and work in the mine. And, he was going to have amputation, especially of his long finger, but we tried the device on him. Yeah. This shows you the device placed several different times into the tip, but good function with minimal therapy. And what's fascinating to see here, you can see that in that tip tissue area, you, feeling in the you can see the blood vessels. It's amazing. Here's another lady who came to us, dear hit. She had a subdermal hematoma. There's her wound of her uh, wrist. So again, she was pretty much out of it. So we put the, again, layering the device up. We have the powder down, we have the, burn, uh, the lyophilized the sheets, and then we have the vacuum press sheets on top. Her, again, had, uh, this is a draw text dressing. It's a hydroconductive dressing, and we put tubing in the middle. We just added a couple cc's of saline every day. This shows you that granulation tissue I was talking about, that salmon-y colored granulation tissue. But this goes to all head the to heel. All the way back. Extend the fingers and wrist all the way back. Good function. Yes. Good appearance. Now. Well, I'll go back to this. So anyway, but even in the part here, which we didn't treat, much more inflammation. The area over the wrist is really nice, soft, and supple. And um, it really gives a much superior healing than I could have given with any kind of flap. Here's an 80-year-old gentleman. Uh, he's morbidly obese, fell getting out of the shower. And there's his, uh, as he presents in the ER. He had an open ankle fracture, which they plated. He got up walking around in the hospital against device, had to have it replated. So this elderly gentleman who now is enterobacter, depthroids and bacteroides coming out of this wound with exposed hardware and a degloving wound. You can see it's degloving right here with exposed hardware. We split the device up, put it in there. And again, we, all we did is put this hydroconductive dressing and a tegaderm dressing over it. He comes in here now, and this is a little dry. This isn't eschar or anything bad. You just need to hydrate this more. So we, our dressing initially was a little too dry. We hydrate it up, and there's that salmon-colored granulation tissue that forms. He didn't have a skin graft. He goes ahead and heals up. The skin and this is shows you supple now. It's there's mobility spot, of the tissues. But this but that was over infected open hardware. Has a lot of. Here's another more recent gentleman who comes to us, a uh, 73-year-old, had a cardiomyopathy and a history of gout with a flaring. He developed renal failure, and he had redness of his ankle area. They debrided it and then sent him to me for a skin graft. Not quite ready, because this is what it looked like after it was debrided. So uh, after debridement, so again, the same concept. I put the heavier vacuum press sheets on the outside. I put the lyophilized sheets there, and then I powder underneath of it and I spackle the wound up. You can see the contour. I try to fill the wound with the device and I put the hydroconductor dressing and a tegaderm dressing. This shows you his response then as he's formed the granulation tissue over it. I was tempted to debris this little skin bridge, but I kept it and I was very glad I did. So at the time, I'd like to skin graft this to get him closed up as quick as we can to provide a more thick skin because I think you do get thicker coverage. So this was a thick mesh graft and I put some powder here because we still had some exposed tendon over here on the side and I wanted to optimize that. But interestingly, look at how the healing process goes. This little skin bridge we kept actually had normal, his normal tissue form more. So this isn't wound contracture, this is novo, de novo tissue formation. And so that was the bridge we had and that's what we ended up having him uh, heal up as. The wound is now well see, healed. There is good supple mobility of the skin this isn't contracted down. This is good and tissue good blending. with the layer over top of it. Here's another recent case that came in. Um, this patient comes in uh, and she had, an open, she had an open wound. It didn't involve the ankle, was down to it. So we just stuffed the wound with the device again and put some sheets on her. Um, unfortunately, she was uninsured and was afraid she'd get a bill. So she didn't come back to see us at all. So she had zero post-op care uh, after the three days she was in the hospital. And she came to us because she wanted this staple removed right here. So again, it's wonderful, but the color formation, everything open, the open wound was really pretty amazing with zero care. Here's another gentleman has a pinned under a truck, has this open ankle wound with his tendons. 
Uh, again, we wanted to save as much tissue as possible and not amputate him. At the time we got him, he had had a DVT, he was anticoagulated and had a pulmonary embolism. So we went ahead and debrided his wounds and then we put the device in. Now, I put the device in serially because this was my earlier cases and I wasn't sure what was going on and he had pseudomonas in his wound. So we did several device placements, but once we had the ankle wound closed, we skin grafted it, kept putting material in until the tendons were encompassed into the wound. So at this point we kept going, but he had a little breakdown going on here. So I put a full thickness graft because I like full thickness grafts over the anterior ankle. And as you can see, it didn't take so well, but then eventually did heal up. Here is his scanning, uh, scanning a CT scan showing the, the uh, tendons intact. He did, however, have a bad talus. He had hemarthrosis from the bad talus bone, which had been dislocated, had that fused. But this shows you there is nice his healing of these wounds with time. I'm talking to myself about these things here. Nice but you can see that there is, with time, constructive remodeling going on. There's a more blending of the tissues with time. To talk about the device, total device cost placement was 26000 but I was taking a summer cruise, as I like to do in July, and uh, 5000 of this plus was uh, put on by my associates who just did what I did every week after I was gone for two weeks, but we don't have to keep changing these and putting the device on. As I've shown you in other cases, uh, we don't need to put as much device in the wound. So what have I learned over the time? I like to keep the devices and kept in the wounds with petroleum impregnated fenestrated sheets or gauze. Um, and then moisture balance is important. The moisture balance we classically get in topical wound healing is too dry. So I like to retain it with polyurethane sheets. I may add it with saline as you've seen or use hydroconductive dressings as we've shown. And they do have a smell when you occlude something for a period of time. So you might wanna use something charcoal based or something for this control the smell, alert the patient to that. Overall, if you're thinking about these things, treat these devices as a graft uh, because they really are a graft, it's a xenograft. So secondary dressing should optimize the stability in the wound. And then I like to immobilize joints. I don't want movement around the joints. And so we immobilize those with splints and or sometimes fixation devices. A moist wound is a happy wound, so we want to keep it more moist than we're used to doing. Uh, multiple formulations are important, so one application, as I've shown you, will get you to the finish line in many cases. Debreed the bone with respect. Use low energy devices, all the burrs and things you use. I subsequently use curettes and rongeur devices to take down the bone of the final layer. Radiated wounds, I found, need more serial placements. The devices can have an unpleasant smell, as we've alluded to. And these take time for the constructive remodeling process to occur. So again, I wanna thank you for your attention.